Okay, we can make a start. Today I'm going to talk about the calculation of phase diagrams. Of course, we've already covered that because we've got solution models and we've defined equilibrium conditions. So you ought to be able to find uh, the equilibrium compositions of phases which you place in contact. But what we want to do uh, in real life is we want to calculate these phase diagrams for large numbers of solid species and large numbers of phases. And the simple equations that we derived, where we have this entropy of mixing, and then we add an excess uh, free energy term, and so forth, are frankly too simple to deal with very complicated systems, where we don't have all possible information that we need to put into these equations. Okay? So today's uh, talk is about how to adopt a pragmatic approach towards the calculation of phase diagrams. Uh, so, just to summarize, in an ideal solution, we assume uh, correctly that there is a random distribution of atoms because there's no change in binding energy when we mix different species of atoms together. In a regular solution, we drop that assumption and we have a finite entropy of mixing uh, which contributes to this excess Gibbs free energy Nevertheless, we make the approximation that the atoms are distributed at random, and that clearly is not correct. And so far we've only dealt with binary solutions, mixtures of A and B, rather than A, B, C, D, etc. And we have all our functions symmetrical about x equals 0.5. And again, that's not what happens in reality. The free energy curves have more complicated shapes than being symmetrical about 0.5. So any method that we develop has to give us a greater flexibility in the shape of the free energy surface. And we'd like to be able to calculate the phase diagram for any of these elements added to a particular uh, host. Uh, so for example, if I'm calculating an iron uh, cobalt phase diagram, I'd like to be able to use the same set of equations to go all the way from 100% iron to 100% cobalt. Uh, and I could add, you know, a whole load of elements into that. Typical commercial alloy will contain more than 20 different solids, some of which are added deliberately, some of which are there as impurities. And it might contain six or seven different kinds of phases. So we want a completely general method of calculating phase diagrams, and such a method cannot be completely physically based in terms of the models that we've derived. They're proper, properly based in science. We'll have to use some empiricism. But we'll use empiricism in a very intelligent way, as you see. So the first thing is of course, heat capacity. Heat capacity is fundamental to all the thermodynamic quantities you have because you remember that the entropy change is the integral from T1 to T2 of what? In terms of heat capacity, what you are right? CP, right? CP, Pt. And then you have the entropy change, T1 to T2. What do we have? That's right, Cp over T, P, T. So we need heat capacity in order to uh, define these free energy functions. And I gave you some theory on what controls heat capacity. So what are the factors which control heat capacity, say, in a metal? Go on. What determines the heat capacity in the metal? Any ideas? How about you? Let's. Uh, what facilitates the absorption of energy? The instrument of reduce. Yeah. The instrument configuration. Uh, vibrations. Yeah. yeah. Vibrational heat capacity. And what else? Okay. Magnetic terms, electronic heat capacity, 
uh, if you're working with more complicated molecules, you've got bond rotations and curling up of molecules and so forth and so on. Yeah? All of those processes, you can derive uh, the physics, you can, you can work out all the coupling of vibrations and so forth and derive quite complicated equations which properly represent the heat capacity due to vibrations. However, that's for a pure material. You add another species of atom at random, that equation no longer applies and so forth. So what we do instead is we write the heat capacity as an empirical equation, a function of temperature, where these are experimentally derived coefficients. So the real heat capacity is more complicated than physics can handle. And the form of this equation is chosen to represent the behavior of the heat capacity curve with temperature as accurately as possible. So this is derived from experience that this form of equation treats the heat capacity curve sensibly. So you remember that if I plot the heat capacity looks something like this. where this is the dy temperature, if you remember, where, you know, a metal starts to behave as if uh, it's, uh, it's a gas that all the atoms vibrate independently. Now, of course, uh, we might have complications. We might have, uh, you know, a magnetic term, for example, and that would be an additional term that you put onto this equation. And if this equation doesn't fit the entire space properly, then you just define it over a certain range of temperature and use another equation over another range of temperature. Okay? And that's not a problem when you're dealing with computers. You can just define that, look, these coefficients apply in this range, these coefficients in this range, and so on. <coughs> we then take this equation and we substitute it in here. And therefore, we can define enthalpy changes and entropy changes, and therefore, free energy changes. Because delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, right? Okay, just repetition. And if you integrate that equation according to these two, then again, you'll get a polynomial equation which defines the free energy. So in your thermodynamic database, you would have a set of coefficients. The, the, this is what I mean by coefficients. These are fitted to experimental data. Okay, once we've defined the free energy, uh, this again is the excess free energy. That means the deviation of the free energy from the free energy of mixing for an ideal solution. And this is how we write that. This is another polynomial equation. This is the concentration of A, the concentration of B. This is a coefficient, and this is an exponent, and this is Xa minus Xb. And we can use as many terms here as we like to accurately represent the experimental data. Now, supposing that I equals zero, okay, we, we only use the first term in this equation. What will this reduce to? So, for I equals zero, well, Xa and Xb are still there. Yeah. X A, X B. And we are only going to use one term, I equals zero, so we will have uh, this coefficient L A B zero. What about the bracket? It goes to one, doesn't it? Now does this ring a bell?
you remember? Yeah, the free energy was one of the component of the individual. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's your concentrations. Yeah, more fractions, and that's a constant of some sort. Yeah, but what I'm asking is, in the theory that we've done, does the form of this equation ring a bell? Yeah, you remember the entropy of mixing is the Avogadro's number times the coordination number times one minus x into x and then omega. Yeah, the omega was the binding energy term. That is exactly identical because n a z and omega. We are assuming a constant, which is this. So this. The first term in this equation is simply the regular solution model. Yeah. But it's just a regular solution model. And we haven't gained anything. It's still a symmetrical curve about 0 0.5. If we only use the first term in this polynomial. Yeah, so that is this term. So it's still, it, yeah? Uh, I just uh, I had a question with the previous slide, the equation. This one? It, yeah, is there any reason why it's not shown as delta G? Or is that just a. Yeah, uh, there is a, that's a very good question. Uh, what we do in the thermodynamic database is that we define a reference state. Okay? Uh, and then we define all the terms with respect to that reference state. And when we define it with respect to the reference state, we just use a G instead of delta G. So we are saying, look, the free energy of pure iron at this temperature is so much. Okay. That's an arbitrary sort of reference state. Okay. Okay. okay, so this polynomial equation correctly reduces to the proper theory when we use just one coefficient here. Of course, we can add other coefficients. And the effect of this second term, when i is equal to 1, the effect of this second term is to actually make the regular solution constant depend on concentration. Yeah? This term adds a concentration dependence to the regular solution constant. So we no longer have the symmetry about 0 0.5. Yeah, so if your free energy curve is not uh, doesn't have symmetry about 0 0.5, you can deal with that by adding another term, and another term, and another term, however complicated you like uh, your free energy surface to be. Are you happy with that? Everyone happy? I think we are still considering uh, binary solution. So far, so far. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to deal with higher order solutions in a minute. Okay. But you see, even for a binary solution, by using a polynomial equation, we've managed to produce a free energy curve which is no longer symmetrical, about 0.5. Assuming that this term is finite. Okay, uh, this is just to show you that the first term basically represents this. And if we only had that first term, then we would have symmetry about 0.5, but by including other terms, we can distort that curve. Now, of course, once you have a free energy function, uh, what you're really after are, is that, look, you've got this alloy, you've defined a certain composition, and you know that certain phases exist, but what is the equilibrium composition of each of those phases, and what volume fractions do they have? And that you do by finding the compositions which will give you a uniform chemical potential. So, when we draw this common tangent to the free energy surfaces of these two phases, all we are saying is that the chemical potential 
of this solute is the same in both phases. And similarly, the chemical potential of this element is the same in both phases. Yeah, you remember this definition of equilibrium? That mu i alpha is equal to mu i gamma. Okay, where i can be any solute. In two dimensions, it's straightforward. We draw a common tangent to find that condition. Supposing we have three elements, then those free energy curves actually become surfaces in three dimensions. Right? So this is the free energy surface of alpha and of gamma, and we now have three elements here. Iron, say carbon, and something else. And we then have a common tangent plane. And where, wherever that plane touches both those free energy surfaces, I will satisfy the conditions for equilibrium that the free energy of a carbon atom in alpha is the same as the free energy of the carbon atom in gamma. And therefore, even though the compositions of alpha and gamma are different, there will be no tendency for diffusion. In other words, they are at equilibrium. And you have to satisfy this condition for all three elements. And in general, if you have 20 different elements, then you find the equilibrium compositions by solving those equations simultaneously. Are you happy with that? We haven't done anything new. All we are doing is generalizing this common tangent construction. Tell me if you don't understand anything, okay? Okay, so there's no problem in defining equilibrium for a multi-component, multi-phase system. So if I have another phase here, then I've simply got to add another term here to satisfy uniformity of chemical potential in all phases. Right, so let's now think about how we would deal with a ternary system in our formalism, our pragmatic formalism for calculating phase diagrams. But supposing we don't have any information about ternary interactions, that means interactions between A, B, and C atoms, but we only have thermodynamic data for A, B, B, C, and C, A interactions. Well, we can try and do a ternary calculation, and this is the access gives free energy term. What we are going to do is we'll say we can calculate this from the three binaries. So these equations are exactly the same as the ones we had for a binary, xA, xB, a set of coefficients, and the value of i depends on how, how complicated the function is. And then there is xB, xC interactions, a set of coefficients for BC interactions, and that, and that. So that, there's nothing new, we've simply added the contribution from the three separate binaries. And if this is sufficiently accurate, you don't need to think about ternary interactions. That means A, B a and B interacting with C, and so on. Now, there is a certain elegance about this equation, which makes it practically uh, very, very useful. And that is that if you discover that you've got more accurate data for the C, A interactions, you can simply modify these coefficients without changing everything else in the database. Because look, if I set the concentration of uh, one of the elements to zero, okay. say, say if I set C to zero, this term disappears and this term disappears. And we are left with the pure binary. Okay, so, so modifying these coefficients doesn't influence that or that. So the way the equation is designed is very elegant. Because, you know, now we have massive thermodynamic databases to do these calculations. And every time you have a greater accuracy or a corrected piece of data, you don't want to go and reassess the whole set of data. Yeah. So the way the equations are designed is that if you discover some inaccuracy or new data, you don't need to go back and modify everything else because the fit associated with AB remains the same. But we are using the approximation here 
for doing a ternary calculation that there are no ternary interactions. We are simply extrapolating from the binary systems. Okay, uh, let's look at what happens if there really is a ternary interaction. That is an important interaction. So we would use a term like this, where we have xA, xB, and xC. So clearly this is a ternary interaction. And we have another polynomial, which takes account of the different ternary interactions. Now supposing the ternary interaction is, zero, uh, is uh, simple, then we could just use this term. Yeah. And not use any of those terms. But if it is more complicated, then we have to add further coefficients. But again, the equation is designed so that if I discover a new value for one of these coefficients, I don't have to go away and modify everything in the database. So the, the previous uh, equation takes into account it's a ternary system where you're only considering binary interactions? Yeah, extract exactly right. Okay, and this yeah. one is considering ternary interactions? Yeah, exactly. So this one is an approximation where we are extrapolating from binary systems and hope that our ternary calculation is correct. But if you have experimental data, you might actually have values of these coefficients and this would be a better way of doing it. But you don't have that luxury sometimes. And the best you can do is extrapolate them. But once again, we have designed this so that if you modify one of the coefficients, you don't have to modify everything else. And you can see now how we go to higher and higher order interactions. Yeah? Okay, uh, so here is an example of a phase diagram calculation. And this this, uh, this is probably the most advanced modeling subject in existence. You know, people have been trying to model phase diagrams for something like 60 years and they've done it so systematically. You know, they've collected all possible thermodynamic data, they've assessed the data for accuracy and so forth, and huge, very, very well assessed data banks exist. Okay. And you can buy commercial software or you can you know, you can download it from our website <laughs> to do such calculations. So this is a simple calculation for a calculation for an iron nickel chromium phase diagram. And these are the different phase fields. So there are a number of different kinds of phases. Uh, within each of these phase fields, two phases coexist. Uh, this is a, a phase field where more than two would coexist and so on. Now, to do this experimentally would take you off the order of 10 years. Remember that you're talking about equilibrium. You need, to, you need to make sure that whatever you're studying is at equilibrium. At the low temperature, say 300 Kelvin, there's no way you would be able to generate equilibrium phases other than looking at meteorites. Meteorites cool at about one degree per million years. So when we analyze the phases in there, we can actually get equilibrium information for room temperature. But in general, to do a phase diagram with just three elements, and all these phases would take you, experimentally, it would take you 10 years or more. You can do this calculation in about a few milliseconds. And here's a, another example of a phase diagram calculation with all the phases actually marked in. And this is a simple calculation. We could, we could actually do this for 20 different elements. And there is a whole, uh, whole structure that exists, you know, international cooperation. It's called CALFAD, Computer Calculation of Phase Diagrams. Everybody cooperates to provide data and to have the best methods of doing phase diagram calculations. Do you have any questions? So I have just one final point, 
Now, this is a ternary phase diagram. And, you know, I can say that, look, for this particular composition, I will have graphite, body centered cubic iron, and this carbide phase. And by looking at this in detail, I can say how much of each of those phases I will have available, and the chemical compositions of those phases. So the information that I get from a phase diagram is, number one, the equilibrium compositions, Number two is the quantity of each phase that's present. Or each phase. And I can do that simply by looking at this diagram and saying, look, this is the equilibrium composition of the ferrite and this is the composition of the carbide. And if my alloy is located here, then I can work out how much of this there is and how much of the other phase there is. Now, supposing I had four elements, how would I draw the diagram? You see, this is an isothermal plot at a particular temperature and at a particular pressure. So if I wanted to alter temperature, this would become like a prism. Yeah. Really complicated looking beast. And that's just three elements. What if I had four elements? How would I plot it? And then, you know, if you can answer that for me, then I would ask you, how would you plot five? <laughs> yeah? And so on. Well, I think you have to forget about making plots, because this is the information that you're after. <coughs> yeah? There's no need for you to draw any diagrams. You simply get a table of the equilibrium compositions of every phase that exists, and the amount of each phase that exists. Okay. In fact, if you try to draw diagrams even for the ternary system, you will frequently make mistakes. You will violate certain thermodynamic rules and so forth. So my recommendation is forget about drawing diagrams. This is the information we are after. Okay. Any questions? Okay, see you next time.